Before we dive into the episode, make sure you hit subscribe on the podcast platform you're listening on. Also, follow me on X at The Dave Dynasty and subscribe on YouTube by looking up Nostalgic Dave Dynasty. You can also buy one of my shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com slash The Dave Dynasty. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to one hour of the toughest, roughest wrestling you'll ever see. That's right, Dick the Bruiser said it all. The big question, have you got the endurance? Have you got the brains to get past the excellence of execution? Where are all the gutless American wrestlers step in the ring with the Baron and face the brains? The reason why Axe and myself were put on this earth is to demolish people. Bobby Heenan, that is a very good-looking sport coat you've got on. Yeah, and I paid for mine. Mine isn't government issue. Hello, everybody. Lance Russell and Dave Brown right along ringside. By golly, we're ready to go with another big week of championship wrestling. Greetings, wrestling fans, and welcome to Wrestling Nostalgia. I'm your host, Dave Dynasty. Thank you for joining me for another episode. Uh, today's guest is Carrie Silken. We talk about Ring of Honor, of course, New York music, and much more. Uh, but before we get to that, I do have a few things I'd like to talk about. Uh, two episodes ago, I talked with Cliff Bumgarner, Chris Lay, and John Hitchcock about the Dorton Arena wrestling documentary, When Giants Walked Here. Uh, well, that documentary was released on August 8th, and I'm hoping that all of you listeners gave it a watch. Uh, it is a very fun and cool watch. I highly recommend you seek it out if you haven't seen it already. Uh, and the documentary is available to watch for free on the PBS app. So go check that out. Uh, last episode, uh, my guest on the show was Korchenko. And there's been some great response to it from the listeners, uh, particularly uh, about Korchenko's telling of the incident that caused him to leave the UWF. Uh, so if you haven't already listened to it, Uh, Go check it out in the archives, along with some of the other great interviews I have uh, for you there. And also, be sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Uh, A couple weeks ago, SummerSlam was held on August 3rd. I did talk about it last episode, but it uh, it was a fairly solid show in my eyes. Uh, The highlights for me were uh, Ron Breaker winning the Intercontinental title. I'm a Breaker fan. Uh, Gunther winning the world title. I'm a Gunther fan as well. Uh, the, The Drew McIntyre versus CM Punk match I thought was a lot of fun. And then, of course, the return of Roman Reigns. What a what a reaction from the crowd to Roman's return. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where they go from here, uh, especially when it comes time for Paul Heyman to return also. So uh, lots of interesting things happening in the world of the WWE. Uh, coming up on the show on August 25th, that is my next episode on the AWA Deep Dive series looking at August of 1988. Uh, So if you have any questions about this month in AWA history, submit those to me on social media ASAP uh, to have me a tip to respond on the show. I'm going to be recording that in the near future, so get those questions in very, very soon. Uh, Before I get into things today, I'd like to send a special thank you to Starkville Charlie for sending me a copy of his book titled What Happened to Our Wrestling? I will be diving into the book soon and will give a review on it in a future episode of the show. If you'd like to get your copy, and I highly recommend that you do, you can order a copy on Amazon. Again, look up the title, What Happened to Our Wrestling, and you will find it there. Uh, Last week, the wrestling world lost Kevin Sullivan, who passed away on August 9th. Uh, Kevin had been dealing with several physical ailments following an accident in May. Uh, Kevin is obviously known... uh, that's having a great mind for the business, right? He was a, a great worker, but he's obviously a very creative booker and an ideal man. Uh, very big impact in the world of professional wrestling, uh, and he will be missed. He was very talented and entertaining, so uh, you know, rest in peace, Kevin, and sending out condolences to all of his family and friends and those who uh, were influenced or touched by his work in the wrestling business. So, all right, let's take a break. When we come back, I'll have that interview with my guest, Carrie Silken. So stick around. 
Hey guys, Ray Russell here, curator of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, inviting you guys to listen to many of the programs here as part of the WrestleCopia brand, including, but not limited to, the Wrestling Memory Grenade, currently covering the 1988 and the WWF project. You can also listen to the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories, whether it's Jamie Ward with Georgia 81, Roman Gomez with the UWF in 1986, or Gene Jackson covering Memphis in 85. Three projects going on right now over there at Regional Wrestling. You can also listen to the Wrestling Stoop with the legend himself, Bob Roop. Bob goes back in time each and every week, covering not just his career, but countless stories and interactions with hundreds of wrestling names spanning his two decades in the business. But that's not all. You can also check out the Puro Wrestling Academy with the professor of Puro Resu, Mr. Dan Ginnity. Dan and I go back in time and cover the history of Japanese professional wrestling in the English language. And you can listen to all of those shows and more, all part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, located over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and anywhere your podcast streaming needs are met. From Apple to Spotify, Pocket Cast, and beyond. And while you're at it, why not subscribe to our social media guys for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. Plus, I'm constantly adding old school video clips and pictures from throughout wrestling history. You can follow us over on X, formerly Twitter, at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R A S S L I N Grenade. Also, follow and like me, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And why not subscribe to YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade. So if you're looking to support that next up-and-coming podcast brand, please consider making it WrestleCopia. This is Listen to Their Screams, a horror podcast that feels like you're chatting with friends. Hello, I am one of your friends, Dave. I am one of the co-hosts of Listen to Their Screams with my friend Ike, and we want you to come and check us out. We are a fun-filled podcast positive horror movie podcast that does reviews news birthdays anniversaries we play games we are a ton of fun every week for you the horror fan out there for all of our links to our social media and the podcast platforms just check out our link tree it is l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash listen to screams that is listen the number two and screams or look us up on your favorite social media platform and podcast provider. All right, welcome back to Wrestling Nostalgia. This time I'm being joined by Carrie Silken. Carrie, how are you? Hello, Dave. What's going on, my man? Oh, not much. Let's let's talk about you growing up because you've talked a lot about it. You grew up in the New York area as a wrestling fan in New York. So when when did the bug get you? When did you fall in love with wrestling? Well. My uh, older cousin, Mike, who comes into my wrestling story a number of times, he originally turned me on. You know, I'm, I'm old. I'm I'm old, dude. And uh, we're talking. Uh, wrestling was on. I lived in North Jersey, Central Jersey, 45 minutes out of New York City. Yeah. So. Back in 1966, <laughs> wrestling was on Channel 5, the same Channel 5 that exists today, for two, imagine this, two hours on Saturday nights from the wrestling capital of the world, Washington, D.C. <laughs> and it was WWWF wrestling. And it was like January of 66. And it's funny, a couple of the remain of the only, there's a story behind it, but there's, there's full two hour. It might've been the first one I ever saw. There's like three of them that somehow you ever, well, you would know there's Pedro Martinez from that promote. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Somehow he got hold of the tape somehow. And they went from here to there. What I'm trying to say in a very roundabout way is the probably the first couple wrestling shows I saw on TV uh, exist on YouTube today. Oh, and yeah. the bug bit me right away. 
even though these were squash matches, uh, nothing competitive. I liked the interviews. I liked seeing, I liked Bruno. Um, I liked the bad guys, but um, I, I, I was fascinated by it, you know, and I was a sports fan. My dad brought me up as a Yankee, you know, into real, real sports, the Yankees and <laughs> old basketball. He didn't like wrestling, you know. But uh, that's when the bug bit me. And I used to run around my town to, you know, back then at 10 years, 10 years old, I could run around town. No one was worried about you getting abducted or anything. <laughs> I went to various candy stores with the little bit of money I changed I could get from my allowance or my dad would throw me a dollar or two. And I, I went on search of wrestling magazines and yeah. uh, off it went. Yeah. Hey, well, you're also known for being a big rock and roll guy and, oh, yeah. uh, and a music guy. When So when when did that, did that hit the same time? Did you just grow up with both wrestling and rock and roll? Pretty much. You know, in 1960, and goes again to Mike, uh, my cousin, <clears throat> Uh, well, actually, when the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan, mm -hmm. it was like, a, you know, a national story. Yeah. And it was, you've heard all this. Yeah. And uh, these guys with long hair, right? <laughs> I was like eight. And uh, I started listening to AM radio because there was no other. That was it. Yeah, yeah. And I became I, I became a rock and roll guy, and through Mike's influence again, in late 1967, he says to me, "Hey, there's this new thing." I'm like, "What?" He goes, "Well, it's hard to explain. It's radio stations with like uh, higher numbers." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" Well, he was talking about FM radio. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> My dad got me a transistor radio that got AM and FM. And that's where, you know, all the, uh, at the time, 68, 69, I was only 12 and 13, but I got into Jimi Hendrix. I got into, you know, Cream and The Who and everybody and uh, on the radio. So, yeah, I was right there when FM radio started excuse me and I, I i i took advantage of it and uh i uh you know when i was when i was old and old see old enough back then and probably you too <laughs> when we were 16 we would go take the bus or the train into the city 16 17 and you could get in new york city uh, for a 45 minute train or bus ride, and my parents had taken me. My mother liked Broadway once in a while, and that my dad would take me to Yankee Stadium, and I sort of knew the lay of the land. And uh, we, I started going to concerts in 1973. Um, my first concert ever, real rock and roll concert, was Deep Purple oh, yeah. and Rory Gallagher. You ever hear that name? I have, yeah, yeah. Um, was it at yeah. that? Was it at the Garden? It was at the the, the Felt Forum. That okay, was yeah. The uh, four thousand. It was Dave. It was so loud, and it is. <laughs> it's even in the Guinness Book of Records. Not that show. That tour. Um, and that was when the Made in Japan album had come out with, you know, yeah, women, yeah. big hit, Highway yeah. Star. Yep. And, but it was so fucking loud. And I thought, damn, is every concert going to be like this? <laughs> uh, in 73 was a, a crucial, pivotal year because the, the first arena concert I saw 
was my was the beloved Led Zeppelin Houses of the Holy had come out. Yeah. And I got myself and my friend got tickets and we went to see the mighty Led Zeppelin. And you know what? I thought it was me. Um, it didn't sound good. Now the crowd, <laughs> the, this was the song remains the same tour. Mm. So the I, know I'm, I know I'm driving off all of your wrestling listeners. No, 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 no. I don't care. <laughs> um, but yeah, now that out, they all I knew as a, as a 17 year old was that when they did whole lot of love. When they did uh, rock and roll, when they did Heartbreaker, when they did even the beloved Stairway to Heaven, it just was missing something. Or, or I, like I said, maybe it was me. Crowd reaction was good, and I left that. You know, what came off really good at that show was. Uh, some of their mellower stuff, like um, the ocean. Not, it, there's two songs on Houses of the Holy that are uh, that are uh, more relaxed. Yeah, like uh, like like Dire Maker or something like that. Uh, you know, Dire that the, Maker the, that is that uh, that reggae kind of song. Yeah, hold on, I'm gonna look it up because now it's yeah. gonna drive me nuts. But. Uh, Uh, bu, 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 bu. Well, as I look for it, I left. I left there very confused and conflicted because I <laughs> loved Led Zeppelin so much. Here it is: um, the Rain Song. Oh, yep. And no quarter. Oh yeah, yeah. John, John Paul Jones song here, right, with all the organ. Right, and. Uh, so that was in July, and the very next morning, just by happenstance, one of my friends calls me up and says, hey, tickets went on sale for Jethro Tull, and we're going to, and I said, well, where is it at? He said, my friend Gary, he says, oh, it's at the garden. I said, I don't want to go. I mean, I had the Aqualung album mm. and I I might have had Thick as a Brick mm -hmm. and uh, and he's like, oh, come on uh, Diane's going, Tommy's going, you know, the whole crew. <laughs> All right, fine. Get me a ticket. So, the month later, it was the I don't know how familiar you are with Tall, but they had an album called Passion Play. Yep. The follow right. the brick is a brick. Mm -hmm. and to show you how different times are now, the other few weeks ago was the anniversary date of the Thick as a Brick album. Are you, are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah, with right, yeah. One kid, boys and girls, it's you used to put on the record and it was one straight song and then he flipped. And the wreck, and this is after the Aqualung album, which was a big fucking hit. And uh, the record company guy said to them, "What are you crazy? <laughs> Can't play this on the radio." That album went to number one for two weeks, thick as a brick. <laughs> it's nuts. So anyway, it was the Passion Play tour, which also went to number one for one week, uh, but. It was very hard for me at 17 to really, uh, I remember playing the Passion Play album over and over and it was, it's thick, dense music. Now it's one of my favorite and it's a tall, but anybody, here's the point. Um, we went to tall and we had seats in the upper level, the blue section, they used to call it the garden, as far away from the band as possible. And all I, I, I took a lot of time just to tell you that all I knew was when they did Cross-Eyed Mary, 
and they did it's a new day yesterday and they did locomotive breath let alone aqualung let alone the whole passion play it sounded just like the fucking record <laughs> i went back twice to see zeppelin the the zeppelin 70 that was 73 75 and 7 and they needed an extra guitar player on stage. Yet in 96 or 7, when Page and Plant toured, it was fucking awesome. Yeah. So went to the Tull show, blew our minds. Uh, within a few months, got to see the Who do Quadrophenia. Yeah. Oh. Paul McCartney's first tour wing. These all happened like 74, yeah. uh, 74, five. Paul McCartney wings over America. George Harrison, the Dark Horse tour. I was at the 73 Stone show. They had Billy Preston in the band. Um, Grateful Dead, uh, the band, uh, Genesis, yes. Uh, it was just great, you know. The Black Sabbath. I mean, we would go to anything. Yeah. We didn't get, if it was if it was Black Sabbath or it was Elton John. You know, it's, there was a huge dichotomy in the music. And the other thing was was if you went, I remember being at the Elton John show Thanksgiving night of 1974. That was the last time John Lennon ever made a public appearance on stage. Mm-hmm. And you would, some people would think, oh, Elton John, you know, the crowd. Well, back then, Elton John's crowd was hard to distinguish between a, uh, you know, um, a, a heavier show, like a Sabbath, yeah. right? Like Mountain. They were just rock and roll fans. And, yep. uh, it was a be- it was a fantastic era, and I I continued <clears throat> I've continued my whole life to uh, really enjoy live music. And, yeah, uh, well, well, talk to me how going to all these concerts, these wrestling shows, everything else. You ended up being kind of the ticket guy, right? You were selling tickets and doing things. How did that? Where how, where did that come into it? Well, you got to, dude. You have to. Uh, I mean, I've got 75 episodes of my life story that I <laughs> I did with Ian Riccoboni. Yeah. Last yeah. at that our, the last stop Penn Station, which yep. combines these these wrestling stories, which combines the Ring of Honor, the whole Ring of Honor saga, combines uh, my, you know, love of baseball and rock and roll combines my dereliction and drug use and uh, sexual uh, oddities and uh, <laughs> it's the whole, you know, the whole scene in the 70s, 80s New York. And I wound up falling into the ticket business on the street. As a as a ticket scalper, and uh, all those all that that whole backstory to that is on the last stop Penn Station podcast, which just like your podcast, this podcast, it's you know it's uh, Apple, Spotify, it's on everywhere. So yeah. I I got into the ticket business, and but you know I was I was in the throes of super addiction uh which at the time was cocaine and alcohol uh which which went on i mean i should have been dead a hundred times which went on between 75 to 91 and a couple of relapses after 91 but all in all the whole journey uh with work in the street I finally got off the street. I cleaned up my act. 
I, a kindly guy took me in as a, uh, working in his ticket office on the phones and I did deliveries for him too. And eventually, uh, once again, there's, uh, all this is available on last stop Penn station. Eventually in the nineties, after going to rehab again, uh, I uh, opened my own ticket business, Rave Review Tickets, and uh, I, you know, it was, it was still a good time for tickets before these ticket prices are just, re- you know, it, it's yeah. it's insanity. Yeah, it's yeah, insanity. But like yeah. the face value of some of these tickets, I was looking at the Eagles at the Sphere. Yeah, I mean. I'm talking about face values, you know, like a $400 thing. I guess it's very special. I understand. But um, back when I opened my business and the previous eight years when I was in the offices, let alone the street, you can make money. Uh, and this is, don't forget that like, my street thing was pr- way pre-internet. And my ticket office was right when the internet was starting. But, you know, if Metallica went on sale for two nights at the Garden or Celine Dion went on sale for three nights at the Meadowlands or Garth Brooks went on sale for two nights at NASA Coliseum, the phones would light up, you know, and you could, you could, we could get tickets for, reasonable price and sell them and everybody was happy and uh if it wasn't for the whole ticket business there wouldn't have been a ring of honor yeah so so talk about how did you end up investing in ring of honor because right before you outright bought you kind of invested right and it was a backer correct we all know what happened which i i'm you know regarding uh the so-called Ring of Honor scandal. Right. And, you yes. so, and if, if someone does not know about, ooh, what are they talking about? Let's <laughs> hear about the, Just go online and look yeah. up uh, Ring of Honor scandal 2004. But yeah, yeah I, knew, I knew Gabe Sapolsky and, J- J- and Doug Gentry and this mm-hmm. other guy because I was, <laughs> a, I was a faithful ECW fan. Right. And yeah. I I used to go to ECW, and I'm telling you all this rock and roll stuff. Simultaneously with the rock and roll, I was go. I started, you know, going to the Garden uh, for wrestling in like 1971. My dad took me for my 14th birthday because it was a rule. You had to be you had a blue law. You had to be 14 years old. They only enforced it at the Garden. Um, <laughs> And they also had a blue law, no no female wrestlers, no uh, gimmick matches like cage or chain. It, it, they changed all that in like 73, 74. But anyway, yeah. my first garden wrestling match, Pedro Morales and Freddie Blassie. Oh, I yeah. mean, and I love Blassie. So, <laughs> um, so, so I, I was go, I started going to the garden, you know, uh, once a month. But anyway, uh, my wrestling fandom remains strong. It, it, it had some ebbs and flows, but I made it through the whole, I'm going to get to Ring of Honor. I made yep. it through the uh, Morales into Bruno, into the Billy Graham. That was great. Yep. Oh, I remember tripping when Bruno wrestled Billy, we were doing acid, when Billy Graham wrestled <laughs> Bruno uh, in, in a... Uh, a return match um it was very light acid and i remember, <laughs> I remember billy graham's belt like just like sparkling it was like sparkling it wasn't like i was ripping balls and had to run out of the building right yeah. um anyway uh so i would attend wrestling and then you hit that dead period in 91 92 with you know the, the the doinks 
and the WWE with all their gimmicks yeah. and WC. We everyone knows all this shit. WCW was was wasn't a good product. So when ECW, you know, I lived because I, I wound up moving from Jersey out to Pennsylvania, but I was only like an hour outside of Philly, an hour outside of New York, which is if you're on the East Pennsylvania border, that's it's a good spot. So I see this Eastern Championship wrestling on my TV. You know, as Dutch Mantel taught me, uh, a re- any wrestling fan, if there's someone's a wrestling fan, if they, Carrie, if there was a, a piece of paper blowing down the street and it said wrestling on it, and the fan happened, they're going to go, woo, and they're going <laughs> to, you know, so he was right. So I saw ooh, wrestling. So <laughs> I put it on, and it was Eastern Championship Wrestling, and it was it was good. It was different, and uh, it started getting better. And the first time I went was the famous the night the line was crossed. Oh yeah, the, the triple threat the, match, uh, which was. Uh, who the hell was it? Uh, was it Sabu, Shane, and Funk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you know what? I, I it was an earlier one. I got it was one of the ones they had that had the original Sheik there. Oh yeah, Sabu. No, Sabu. Right, right. So anyway, it was still Eastern Championship Wrestling. It mm-hmm. became extreme. I had seasons tickets in the front row. There's uh, there's a a not so famous picture of me hugging Eddie Guerrero. Um, <laughs> and uh, I got to know uh, the aforementioned guys. And uh, when ECW closed, I had a feeling that they're going to uh, do something. Previously to that, Dave, I, um, hold on. Where is it? Oh, yeah. That was not my first foray into wrestling. My first foray oh. into wrestling was doing, I mentioned Dutch Mantel. Yeah. Myself and my cousin, Mike, who was in the uh, publishing, uh, he was a writer, editor. We did a wrestling magazine in Puerto Rico. Oh. This is no. 2000. <laughs> Seriously. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we had the right idea, but it was hard <laughs> to do. That, that's a whole there's, there's two full episodes, three, three full uh, podcasts. My last stop, Penn Station, about my adventures in Puerto Rico, and I could probably do another three or four. It was <laughs> wild. But so post Lucha Libre de Puerto Rico, ECW closes. I knew Gabe and Doug and the other guy, mm-hmm. and uh, I approached them. And uh, they didn't need my help. And I was there as a fan at the first Ring of Honor show. The fa- What was the famous main event with uh, Samoa uh, Joe? Or, yeah, Dan- uh, Dan- Samoa Joe Daniels and who was it? Was it a triple? I think it was a triple threat too, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a triple threat. And it, it and I, I don't, was it the second show where they had Eddie Guerrero against Super yeah. Crazy? Or was that the first yeah, I think, show? No, I, think was, no, I don't think that was still the second, if I'm remembering right. Well, whatever. I was at all those Philly shows. Yeah. And so, and they were great. And a year yeah. and a year, year goes by, close to a year goes by, and then they come to me. You know, obviously, you know, they were in financial disarray, and uh, the ticket business was really good back then. Uh, I got lucky. Um, as I said, I got lucky I didn't die from all my drug use, <laughs> which which resurfaced here and there. But anyway, um, so I bought in, and uh, the the um, you know uh, in two th- early two thousand four, this scandal happened, and uh, I I did not ever intend on wanting to be the owner really. <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of dropped in my lap, uh, and uh, there we were. And uh, 
man, that was a rough time. We didn't talk about a, a, a bridge over troubled waters. Fuck. <laughs> but, you know, we uh, we got through it with the help of Samoa Joe and CM Punk's trilogy. Yeah, good with stuff. the help with the help of Ricky Steamboat. People forget this. Ricky yeah. Steamboat and Mick Foley. Mick Foley, who would not do want anything to do with Ring of Honor because of this other person he accused of making a lot of money on his videotape and never giving him shit. Mm. So once he was gone, Mick was cool. So, and what a pleasure, you know, and I got to be, I got to be friends with him. We went to a few, I went to like three or four shows, concerts with him anyway. But, you know, in 2004, five and six, we had Foley for like, I don't know, eight shows, uh, Steamboat for a number of them, and Carnet, right? And uh, we respected, and I respected res- wrestling history. These yeah. are two words that don't that don't go together: wrestling and history. You know, there's revisionist history. Um, so that was the you know Ring of Honor. Once the stink blew away from the uh, problem it took like a year uh we were we were uh we were we were rocking not financial we yeah. were like the, the, we were like that band that's critically acclaimed critically acclaimed but ever, never makes any fucking money yeah i mean you said that in the past right you you constantly lost money in ring of honor never made money constantly it was a passion not, project. Nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing. I mean, uh, a, a nine-year-old kid that knew how to add numbers <laughs> would have said, oh, I don't think this is good. You're, you're <laughs> and, and, and it's like, it's true. But, you know, because of my pride, because of my ego, because I knew we had a good fucking product. Yep. Uh, and I was, and the ticket business was healthy. Um, I just, you know, I made good money in one place and <laughs> pissed it away, as my father would say, <laughs> you pissed it away. But, you know, we uh we did some good stuff man and you know uh got involved with pro wrestling noah they got wanted to it was amazing they wanted to get involved with us bringing over kenta and marafuchi Mm -hmm. and and this and that and uh yeah some wild shit yeah it pretty much anybody who's any anybody in the business in the last whatever, 10 to 20 years, including so many guys right now that are standing out on national on worldwide television, got their, you know, cut their teeth in ring of honor, right. Really made their name in ring of honor. Do, do you take, I mean, do you take pride in that? I mean, you oh, weren't yeah. making money, but, but no one, Hey, you, if you were to flip on the TV and see it, you know, whatever, a, a Seth Rollins, a, a, a Kevin Steen on and on and on. Hey man, those were your boys. Well, yes, absolutely. I had a very good experience uh, eight days ago, uh, AEW was right down the road for me, and I hadn't been to an AEW event in a while, and uh, it was like an episode of All My Children. <laughs> Nigel, Mc- Nigel McGinnis, Jay yep. Lethal, Roderick Strong, not my man Nana, Bobby Cruz, our old ring announcer, uh, Oh Christ! The list goes on and on. Um, even guys like Orange Cassidy—they had a cup of coffee in Ring of Honor, you know, yeah. Jim and uh, Shingo. Shingo was there from Dragon Gate, and uh, I hadn't seen him in years. And uh, Okada—you know—I knew Okada from the later years of Ring of Honor. But yeah, the Earl of oh, Samoa Joe. Oh so yeah, 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 obviously. Yeah. You know, and, did, uh, uh, did you see Mark Briscoe? 
Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. He's the best. The best. Boss yeah. man, excuse me, the boss man. <laughs> All the highest of hellings to you. Well, I mean, let's talk about that, man. The Briscoes. Uh, the, uh, mm. You think Ring of Honor. You think Mark and Jay Briscoe. At least I do. Right. They were. Yes. They were Ring of Honor. Right. They stuck with Ring right. of Honor. From day one. From day one. So All now. the way through. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I don't know if you, I don't even know if you can put it in a word, but how important were the Briscoes to Ring of Honor through all those years? I think their importance might have been, uh, I don't know if overlooked is the right way to put it, under, under, under uh, appreciated. You know why? Because they were just always there. They were always there. Yeah. You understand what I'm trying to say? They were I always do. there. They were always there. Um, they never had a bad match. And um, yeah, what 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 great guys. I mean, uh, obviously, it's just so sad with Jay. Oh, uh, yeah. But um, yeah, they, these guys, and they were, you know, people see them on TV. That is them. That is them. <laughs> that is them. That is them. And uh, and that was them, you know, uh, back then. Uh, and Papa Briscoe used to come. <laughs> He's he. You you wouldn't want to fuck with him. <laughs> so you think the Briscoes were, you know, he. I mean, like these guys, they're the real deal. And the and and Mama Briscoe, she's cool too. But uh, but yeah, they uh, they were. They were the cornerstones. They were the, you know, the, the, they could be the Mount Rushmore on their own. Yeah. I mean, yeah, people never stop and think all those years, right? You go, they're there. No one ever stopped and think, I mean, what if they weren't, right? Because right. they were, ju they just were. You just assumed if there's a ring of honor, they'll be the Briscoes. Well, you never stop well, and thought, what well, if they weren't there? Well said, my man. Yeah. And, uh, man, I, I've always loved the Briscoes. And, uh, it's, it's it's funny. People always ask, "What about the chicken farm and all that?" It's like, "What what is that all about?" It's like, "Well, because those, those guys work on a chicken farm. Their family had, they do that." <laughs> I said to Jay Briscoe one time, "I said, let me ask you something, dude. You got the chickens, and it's like a hatchery. So, I, just because I didn't know what they did, what it really was. Yeah, so, they get these shipments of eggs, and." <laughs> The chickens, thousands, like 17,000, I think was the number, just the way the, 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 the system worked. And then there's suddenly 17,000, or maybe there's a few uh, unfortunate ones that don't aren't born, but uh, there's 17,000 baby chicks. And off they go to the next phase of their lives which isn't promising right <laughs> yeah so i said to jay i go hey what if like one of the little chickens baby chickens whatever they call them chicklets <laughs> is that what they call them i don't what know they, <laughs> uh chicklets something to eat would it be a, a mint um anyway what if one of the little chickens was like walking around you had forgotten and we maybe save it as a pet. He's like, nope. <laughs> Boss man, you can't do that. You know, off they go. But yeah, um, uh, that's, yeah, they, uh, I remember an early Ring of Honor show. I, when I say early, 2005-ish, we had a trouble. We couldn't get into the old ECW arena. It was, for whatever reason, it was booked, and there was an armory that we would use. Maybe we hadn't gotten in there yet, but anyway, we wound up being in some some Ramada or Sheraton near the airport in a ballroom that had way too low of a ceiling. Um, no. And I used to. There was a protocol that we. Any building we went to, we needed a minimum of 18 feet because my, my claim to fame 
personally is I instituted the lighting, the guardrails, the entranceway, the follow spotlight, and other gimmicks. Uh, I remember when I first wanted to do this, Gabe says to me, and he's a rock and roll guy. He loves Rush. He loves this and that. Uh, he says, oh, Carrie, he goes, um, you know, we're just an indie. I, I don't want to see you spending that. I go, Gabe, when you go to see Rush or you go to see Slayer or whoever you like, right? Uh, or even if you go to a movie, what happens before it starts? Well, the lights go out. And what happens when the lights go out? The people pop. I go, all right, trust me on this. And at the Murphy Rec Center, which was a shit, talk about a shithole. <laughs> God forbid you had a bad stomach day. There was, oh, no. one, there was one toilet in the whole place. <laughs> the whole place. Think of that. Anyway, but it had a high ceiling. That it had. And I got a lighting company from Philly, four towers, six white par six par concert lights, the classic lights, uh, with you know, with no gel. And you know, so you had 24 lights in the four corners on a dimmer. So you could bring them down. Mm -hmm. One follow spotlight. And we made a little entrance way. And it was rock and roll. And all of a sudden, at the Murphy Rec Center at 7.30, whoever it was, the maintenance man, do you a favor, turn the lights out. And the fucking place went crazy. <laughs> and so did he. And I, I had also simultaneously, you know, I'll get to Mark, to Jay Briscoe. I, or Mark Brisco, I, I simultaneously noticed on Monday Night Raw, they had they did away with the uh, they did they had solid guardrails, black, not yeah. the bicycle. So we we I'm like let's push the Ring of Honor logo. You know, it was the dot com era, and we yeah. we made up these guardrails. And it's funny that they were, were you ever at the shows with the old aluminum, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It became part of the show. Yeah. Like if you had a front row seat, you know, yep. you got the, and it also caused a lot of injuries to the wrestlers. I still, <laughs> some of these guys today, we, they uh, pleasantly uh, joke about it. Like when I saw Roderick Strong, uh, you know, at AEW or not, you know, those fucking guardrails. But, uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, we, we, you know, and that, Dave, that was a big, uh, people don't realize it. It was a subconscious way to make our product seem bigger than it is. And right. to give it, you know, have that lighting. You know, then eventually we, we worked with a lighting company in the Midwest for those shows you went to in Chicago and Dayton. And we got like the hazer, you know, that like, and then we got some moving lights on, on the uh, towers for the entrances and it was good. But this one night we were in Philly and it was an emergency building and it was a very low ceiling and we had the lights up, but it was like, they're just coming in. But what happened was, was Mark, I forget which Frisco, my, whoever Frisco does some move. The big thing was watch the ceiling. There's a beam dead center, you know, and he hits his head. I mean, I thought he was dead. And, and after the match, I'm going back. I'm, I'm like, dude, and he's like, oh, boss, man, it's, it's all right. It's only my head. <laughs> only my head. Oh. Well, but, yeah, talk to us so, uh, a little bit. You've talked before about over the years, you had two very light interests in someone purchasing Ring of Honor. And it's into the two names are interesting, right? That you that you brought up. You said in 2007 that Jerry Jarrett had some interest. And then how much? Was, yeah, very little. So he did just a light contact, right? I mean, this was. Nothing. It was like a, a fart in the night. 
um, just nothing, just like. And the other one was a text message from CM Punk. CM Punk, yeah. Who, who, you know, who's gonna text if you're gonna do business? <laughs> but um, thank God for Jim Carnett and Gary Juster, because through Jim, and then thus Gary Juster and boys and girls who are listening. Dave does some real classic wrestling history, so he probably has savvy listeners. But uh, in case you don't know that name, Gary Juster booked the buildings and promoted shows early on in Baltimore and then got a gig with the old NWA uh, from the Crockett's to the Ted Turner's. And he was there to the dying day, you know, that, that special that's out now. He yeah. was there to the dying day. But Gary knew Joe Coff. Joe oh, Coff yeah. worked for Sinclair Broadcasting. And do, Dave, you know that 1984-85 Battle of the Belts from Florida? It was a yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was a Joe Coff production. He had his oh, hands yeah. in so, really? I, see, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, Sinclair at the time had 70 affiliates around the country. And uh, I mean, I sold it for pennies on the dollar. They, 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 I love Joe Cobb. He's a great guy. But yeah. the corporation, they weren't spending fucking money. Uh, and the only thing I had of value really was the tape library. And at the time, besides the guys that migrated to TNA, Samoa Joe, Brian Kendricks, uh, Lethal, the only star in WWE was Punk. So I knew the tape library would have value eventually, but I'm not going to have any money, you know, uh, to, to wait. So um, we did the deal in, uh, it took it, it, dude, it took like a year, a year and a quarter. Oh. You know, talk about due diligence. Jesus. <laughs> um, but they bought it and they treated me well, not financially, but. Joe knew to have me around because people just, they didn't want uh, them to think, you know, the people like that was like Ring of Honor is now this corporate thing. Ring of Honor was always, even at our not so great moments, Ring of Honor was always like, you, you're you a fan of Ring of Honor, you're in a Ring of Honor show, it's like, you're part, it's a thing, you know, and it's a family, and you're part of it. And they they didn't want to have the image that oh Sinclair Broadcasting um, multi million dollar company buys it, so they kept old carry around, which was good. And uh, I, I loved that period because I could just come and go when I want. Didn't cost me a nickel. Uh, <laughs> people were everyone was nice to me. I, I felt like I felt like the. Uh, the family dog at your aunt's house on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Everyone pets me, feeds me, and says nice things. And then I leave. And, yeah. you know, so that was a good period of time. And you know what, man? God bless Sinclair. Uh, they get knocked. And, you know, I, I'm like I'm like one of the only promoters ever that never had a blowout with Jim Carnett. Me, mm -hmm. he had a blowout with Sinclair. I'm sure you're aware of it afterwards. Yeah, yeah. but but it's like I, I like you know Jim doesn't give he gives correct history up until his you know but after he left um, the product you know. It stayed alive uh, until 2021, but you know, it went through all kinds of ebbs and flows. But when the when Cody and the Bucks 
uh, mm. came in, and I was always a big proponent of the Bucks. Carnet didn't like them, mm -hmm. but yeah. they were good. The fans liked them. So uh, in that second, you know, with the Bullet Club shit and all that, uh, and and it caught some traction, and uh, it was a perfect confluence of 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 everything in 2019 when WWE had WrestleMania for the second time at Giant Stadium, and after some problems. Gary Juster was able to secure Madison Square Garden because yep. WWE was given all their business to the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. And the WWE tried to block it. It was a Saturday night. We're lucky that Kendrick Lamar or Billy Joel or whomever <laughs> was, did not have it booked because Lord knows they'd rather have the merch and food mm -hmm. money from a good you know, <laughs> yeah. wrestling uh, but we had we had the date and on April 6 2019 there I was the kid that went to see Blassie and Bruno Sam, uh, and Blassie and Pedro Morales the kid that got to see Jethro Tull and, and all the other Quadrophenia and everything else and uh, going to all those wrestling shows all my life, the kid that stood outside Madison Square Garden, the degenerate that stood outside Madison Square Garden, hustling tickets from 85 to 91. And there I was, standing in the ring at Madison Square Garden, giving the belt to Matt Taven, getting to do the walkout at the beginning of the show. And uh, the odds of this happen, this whole thing, is sort of like, you know, the, the like Powerball kind of odds. Yeah. Because <laughs> it was just, you know, you know, it was a, it was a, it was Dave, it was, a, it was a great payoff, you know. Um, and there was a lot of good, you know, there were so many highs and lows. But uh, and and then you know with the with the ep I was gonna say that with the pandemic, yeah. And S Sinclair was really good to these guys. They paid everybody for like a year and a half trying to do these shows with no people there, and uh, a lot you know they wanted to dump it. I knew that I knew that they were having talks with WWE because of the library. Yeah. And uh, along came Tony Khan. Um, and uh, I, I made a, a, a brief appearance uh, on a couple of shows, but hopefully uh, Ring of Honor gets treated with a little more dignity. <laughs> I was going to ask about that because I, man, I, I, I can't watch it. It doesn't, it doesn't feel, it doesn't have the same feel, right? It's just, it's oh, not, wow. the, it's not the spirit. And, no, uh, it's not the spirit. And, and, but you know, it's okay. I mean, it is, it's yeah, but it's the name only. Sure. It's just the name only. And, uh, even in our, even in my roughest times when we, you know, we lost Nigel and Brian Danielson the same night. And because uh, they were moving on, uh, and 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 in Sinclair, there were some thin years, uh, but you know, and then when the Bucks and Cody left for AEW, uh, Ring of Honor was limping along, but it was still okay. Um, you know, look, God bless Tony Khan. Uh, he's keeping the name alive, but. Uh, it ain't the same, and uh, it, it's I don't know. Um, I, I'm glad I'm glad it exists, but it exists in name only. That's yeah, it. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm 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 kind of holding hoping that he'll do a little more with the tape library, and uh, you know at, at some point in time with one of his you know when he cuts a new deal with someone or something, who knows? I mean, I'm hoping to see a little more of that tape library out there. Well, what, what the only you know 
I like Tony Khan. He's a nice man. And, and I, you know, my, some of my friends wrestled, worked there. But um, I, I think if there was a, a, you know, forget that honor club bullshit. Uh, that was something that we had. And it didn't work back then. Why, you know, obviously he doesn't have a place to put it on, on cable TV. Yeah. But if, if there would have been a place or even... It's like with this honor club, you should have Jay Lethal on it. You should have Mark Briscoe on it. You should have these other guys, the Kyle O'Reilly's, the 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 Adam Coles, uh, the, the, the just the, the Roddies, the you know um, the, the people that were Taven and Bennett, you know uh, the the people that were associated with Ring of Honor should be, at least be under that umbrella. Just my opinion, you know, and maybe, I, I agree. <laughs> maybe it'll happen when it gets on some kind of, uh, it gets out of solitary confinement on the honor club. <laughs> yeah. you know? uh, so it's, uh, well, and what about a guy who, who, you talked through the Sinclair years and all this and that different times it limped. A guy that was, I mean, to me, it was very crucial. Helped so, but did so much. And a guy I can't believe is not employed somewhere now in, in some capacity. What about Delirious? What, oh, he is employed. Is he? Where's he he's, at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's working uh, for uh, TNA. Oh, okay. See, I don't pay. I don't pay a lot of attention to TNA. Well, it's all right. <laughs> I don't either. But yeah, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, delirious. Good. For, I mean, I'm the one that I'm the one that gave him the job. I went from Gabe to Adam Pierce to Delirious, and uh, yeah, he's at he's at Impact or whatever they're called this week. Um, <laughs> yeah. and I'm happy for him. Uh, he's a great guy, and uh, he deserves the best. Boy, the bullshit he put up with, the bullshit I put up with. I mean, <laughs> holy shit! But. Uh, the bullshit all of us put up with. Um, like the Grateful Dead said, you know, what a long, strange trip it's been. <laughs> Indeed. Right? Yeah. And uh, well, and that trip kind of got a highlight, right? You were the first, I mean, take it for what you will. You were the first entry into the Ring of Honor Hall of Fame. And uh, Well, uh, I, uh, along with, it, it was simultaneous, but I'm in the sure, first. Sure, sure. The first class, right. Correct. And, I, and, and yeah, I, I was, that, that was, very very nice and i had no i wasn't aware of it uh they wanted to surprise me you know uh the briscoes are in it and i think samoa joe and cm, CM punk maybe and maybe you know, I, can't, I, don't, I don't know i think yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was i was one of the members and uh yeah so i'm uh you know i'm who are you well i'm carrie silken uh uh, former Ring of Honor owner and current Ring of Honor uh, and and the current I, I I'm Ring of Honor Hall of Famer, yeah. uh, Carrie Silken. So, uh, but you know what? I paid for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, but still, that's something to put on the stationery, right? It's <laughs> yeah, it's cool. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, and. Uh, it's a it's a nice thing. It's a nice thing. It is right. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, it's it's deserving, right? You guys, you know, for your impact and, and Ring of Honor, you can say what you know, say what you want about Tony Khan and his ownership. It's still nice to you know do a little tip of the cap. That yes, it is. And, and uh, listen, I'm I'm happy for that Tony Khan. He's got so much on his plate. I'm not knocking it. It's just it's just. It's like everything else in life. It's just different. It is. I, I wish he, I don't want to go on the side track, but I wish he'd bring someone in just to book Ring of Honor. Just take that off his plate, bring someone mm -hmm. in and let them, let them book that in whatever form it is and uh, let them focus in on that. Give them a, give them a set roster and, uh, exactly. and right. see makes what they can sense. do. That makes sense to me. But uh, well, maybe maybe if he could find a better home for it at some point in time, with you know, I know he's got a new rights deal. Who knows? You know, maybe maybe we'll see a little more focus. Never know. But yeah, uh, there there's still a great great I don't great. There's still a, a long pause there. 
there's <laughs> trying what I'm trying to think of it. There's still a a small but mighty vibe that longs for the days of early Ring of Honor, you know, the, the, the golden era of Ring of Honor. Well, what was the golden era? Well, the golden era was, you know, with the Briscoes and Lethal, Lethal Leaves. Yeah, and we had Spanky early on, my good friend Brian, I love him, and uh, Paul London, and, 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 and I was going to say, Sky Low Low, Low Key. <laughs> Oh, no, no. <laughs> Don't let Loki know <laughs> you said that. <laughs> yeah. Homicide. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. what, an, what, an, what a, a warrior. He was, you know, and 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 Roddy and and, and knucklehead Austin Aries, uh, and Samoa Joe, and, 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 you know, Leading to like uh, Eddie Edwards and Davy Richards oh, yeah, yeah. and Seth and Seth Rollins and Jimmy Jacobs and the you know they were so good and Claudio, Chris Hero, they were so good and uh, then you throw in the the Kentas, the Marafuchis and Morishima who had the ring of honor belts and thank thank you noah they got us they brought us to japan twice uh am amazing and uh you know it, 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 let, let's not forget you know you were there larry sweeney oh yeah he I, he was my buddy, you know, because he, he lived near me, and we became, man, uh, yeah, you know, and like, you know, I see Gabe, Gabe's do, doing well for himself, despite, you know, it took him a while to uh, get past when I let him go, uh, but he's doing very well for himself, he works for WWE, he does mm -hmm. seminars, uh, he was in whatever, and Adam Pierce. I don't got to tell you what he's yeah. doing. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, um, some good stuff, man. You know, and uh, we, we 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 were like the little, uh, you know, we're trying our best. Damn it! Well, so many, so many trends in current wrestling. So many things. Uh, you guys kind of pioneered a little. I mean, you know that. You cut through the, the bullshit, right, and the gimmicks and, and just gave wrestling, right, the, all the partnerships with Japanese talent and, and, and spotlighting those that, you know, I mean, Tony Khan does now. And, I mean, everybody does now. I mean, even WWF has, tip, you know, dipped their toes in that in the past. You guys were doing it. Um, you know, it, just a lot of things that uh, these promotions are using now. Ring of Honor did it or tried it first. Well, and, and, one, and, and something I will definitely tip my hat to Tony – is uh, and we we started first rep uh, and I mentioned it earlier. I referenced it earlier. Respecting pro wrestling history, we yeah. had we brought in Harley Race just to say hello and do autographs. Bobby Heenan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I mentioned Foley Steamboat. I mean, they were part of the shows, not wrestling, but they're just part of the show. Cornet, Bill Watts. Uh, the Midnight Express, and one of the greatest nights of my life in September of 2006, where we got had at our show, and, you know, Gabe was really good. He knew what he was doing. He knew what, you know, he, 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 he paid attention to these indie guys from the Midwest or California, and he was a good scout and as well as Japanese stuff. And, and he, one thing he got completely wrong and uh, it's okay. Um, we were in New York in September of 2006. And I noticed that Bruno San Martino is going to be at a comic book thing uh, in the, in, in the city. And, uh, we, we had already booked the Hammerstein uh, mm -hmm. upstairs, Manhattan Center, where they used to tape Raw. Yeah. You would, lo you would love that place. It, oh, yeah. It, it's because downstairs is the Hammerstein. 
how can there be a 1200 seat <laughs> building on the seventh floor? There yeah. is. And, and that's where, and so I said to Gabe, I said, look, let's, I want to get Bruno. He, it was $4,000 back then. And uh, Gabe's like, Carrie, I know he's your childhood hero, but our fans don't know Bruno. I said, Gabe, this is New York City. Dave, have you ever been in New York? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, then the, the garden is on 33rd Street between 7th and 8th Avenue. The Hammerstein is on 34th Street and 8th Avenue. You're literally in the shadow of the garden. So I said, Gabe, look, I'm going to bring them. Uh, we'll do the autographs. I think it was $25 at the time. And uh, guess what? It was one of the few times I got my money. You know, you know the, the people lined up. Bruno, you know, and when Bruno came out to, to do his... Uh, you know, baby fate put ring of honor over speech. Uh, he was very sincere and it's on tape somewhere. I should look it up. He got, it reminded me of going to a Yankee stadium old timers day when Mickey Mantle was alive and yeah. Joe DiMaggio was alive. And even if you were watching it on TV and when the Yankees, you know, at these old timer games, are you a baseball fan? Or? I am. I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan. Yeah. Right. Right. They probably do it too. You know, yeah. and, and as the, as the introductions go, the, the, the players get, you know, to the biggest and, you know, uh, with the Yankees, it was like, you know, I'm, I'm going way back. I know Yogi Berra, but, you know, after the, First, then Whitey Ford. Uh, and, and then, you know, after Whitey Ford, you know, next to last would be Mantle. But when the, the Mantle's ovation was like two, three minutes of just, you know, they people loved him. And mm -hmm. then the last guy, the greatest living player of all time, the greatest living player of all time ladies and gentlemen welcome back joe dimaggio and that too like these long standing ovations and you know not like a, a round of applause it was like three minutes and people were like weeping and shit it's their <laughs> childhood their life yeah Nano, Nano particularly as as fucked up as flawed as he was, <laughs> you know about him, right? Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. that's why people identified with him. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. When, when Bruno <laughs> came out, it was that. Yeah. And there, you know, Gabe was worried they wouldn't get a reaction. There's our entire crowd and locker room. But, you know, it was a locker room. It was a curtain sellout. Uh, stand, you know, but the at that Manhattan center, the floor, and it had that one circular mezzanine. It's perfect. This long two, three minute standing ovation. And when the people finally mellowed, uh, mellowed out, Bruno was stunned and he looked out and he said, you know, thank you so much. Uh, I, I can't believe this because I'm looking out at the crowd and most of you weren't even born <laughs> when I had my last match. You know, yeah, that's why. That's why. Yeah. To have Bruno, uh, yeah, as well as all the other ones we had, uh, it was it was very special. Yeah, I, I I grew up in Indiana, and it's it, there it was it was obviously Dick the Bruiser, right? Everybody right. had a, everybody had a Dick the Bruiser story, and everybody who wasn't there who does is not familiar. They always say, what was Bruiser? Why was he still wrestling in the 80s? I mean, look how old he was. And I'm like, because everybody still loved Dick the Bruiser. <laughs> and, and you know, he didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to take any bumps. If I, he, <laughs> people loved we, Dick the Bruiser. <laughs> we did uh, an early Milwaukee show. And uh, we had Baron Von Rasky. Oh, yeah, yeah. Appearance. 
didn't do anything except just get in the ring. And, you know, uh, these four, five, six hundred people that were there at that show, uh, they, yeah, they, 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 they popped, you know, people are, you know, just like the, what's the name of your podcast? Wrestling Nostalgia. People are, that's what I, I knew the name of it. Yeah. People are nostalgic and yep. they want that feeling of the standing ovation for Bruno or yep. that feeling for Bruce, Dick the Bruiser, or that feeling for, you know, uh, br- br- uh, bringing out Bob Gibson when he was oh, alive yeah. at the St. Louis uh, Hall of Fame or Stan yep. Usual. I mean, I'm going way back, but, you know, these yep. greats of the great. And, uh, yeah, so this was a very circuitous route to say at least Tony Khan does that. Yeah, he, I mean, there's a reason that. Reason that Vince McMahon back in the eighties, mid eighties, when they went like if they went to Milwaukee, you'd see you know Hulk Hogan teaming with the Crusher. He would just really? like, yeah, yeah, that's, what, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean that you know because everybody knew the Crusher in Milwaukee. <laughs> he was no dummy. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, but uh, he, he knew what he was doing. So, uh, well, Kerry, let's wind this down. We can, man, we we could talk for hours, and we'll have to do we'll have to do another one in the future and dive in a little deep. I could talk rock and roll with you all day. And, yeah, uh, but. Uh, it's fascinating to me. And I, I didn't even talk. I man, I didn't well, even talk. I hope I, I was. I hope I wasn't boring. No, 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 not at all. I didn't. Before we go, I, one story. I, 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 I missed it. I got to come back to it though, just because it, it fascinates me. I've heard you tell this story, but just in case my listeners haven't heard, you've done a lot in wrestling. But I think there's probably one thing that you can say that nobody else has ever done, and is that once upon a time you used to sell cocaine to John Belushi. Well, it was it was just one time. Well, it doesn't matter. I don't know if anybody else in wrestling history can ever claim that. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you want the full story, you got to go to Last Stop Penn Station. But you're so nice. I'll give you an extremely abbreviated version. Uh, I I I was only 22. And he, my, my cousin comes back into the story, Mike G. Uh, he was a music writer and he had some, some kind of comps for some club in the city where a band, a rock, uh, some kind of band was doing a showcase where they're trying to get record company people to come listen to them to get signed. And it was at this nice club which I can't even remember the name of, but it was on the Upper West Side. It was a Tuesday night. Tuesday night in this good weather and I went to the club and uh, I had some packages of of coke boys and girls don't do this this is not good uh, it's bad but uh, so I uh, I figured I'd, I'll check with the you know, the sound man and maybe the guys in the band. It's not like I was standing in the club. Who needs Coke, right? <laughs> I, I, but uh, my friend says to me, hey, that's John Bellucci. Now, I was never around on Saturday nights. I saw the show. This is 1978. Hmm. But uh, I knew the name and I look over, and here's this disheveled man. Uh, I said, see if he wants anything. <laughs> so I'm not paying attention. My friend of came. Of course right, he did. <laughs> my friend came right back. He goes, hey, he just blew me off. I'm like, all right, fuck him. <laughs> so the sound man, he wanted some. I went up to him uh, before that. So the guy's like, yeah, yeah, when the set's over, come in the back. You know, and it was the classic, Dave, it was the classic dressing room, man, club, small club, manager's <laughs> office. So there's like 20 people in this room that's a quarter of the size of the room you're recording this in. And there was only, and there was only one table, well, there was one, there was a chair and a desk, and that was it. And there was 20 people. So uh, this guy's sampling the stuff, and uh, I hear this voice. 
go, yo, yo, you got to grab him. I'm like, and I look, and it's Bellucci took the one chair and took his feet and had his feet up. And I'm like, yeah. And he gets up and he comes up to me. And I'm not that tall. Yeah. But he was like, if I'm five, if I was five, nine or 10, he was like five, seven or eight. <laughs> and he comes up to me. He's like, he go, and, and this is a Tuesday night. At 10 30, 11 at night, he goes, he goes, you got a gram? I go, yeah. He goes, you, you, you got two? Go, yeah. He goes, look, I got to get the money. They're writing Saturday Night Live right now. And I'm thinking, they're writing Saturday Night Live. I go, but it's, I go, but it's Tuesday night. And he was such a jerk off. He goes, and he goes, yeah, that's when we write it. That's when we write it, you know? So I'm like, all right. And, uh, so I knew enough. He goes, look, let's go down to Rockefeller Center. That's where the NBC building, you know. I'm like, all right. Uh, this sounds this sounds interesting. <laughs> Meanwhile, the sound man's going, where are you going? <laughs> so anyway, we uh... went down there. And uh, when the story goes on, We'll have to tell it uh, another time or put on last stop Penn Station. But I had an interesting experience with him, to say the least, which stretched on for most of the night and even, yeah. in, even into the next day. Uh, oh, everybody go check out last stop at Penn Station. Oh, and also, there. I got another plug, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I do uh, Matt Memories with John Arezzi. Oh, yeah, he, yeah. Uh -huh. It came out today that we do a, a, a retrospective of 50 years at Madison Square Garden. So John and myself, actually, you know, it's good because like the last show we did, two shows ago, we had George Napolitano, the, the, the photography Photographer. legend. And we had, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this name, but Evan Ginsberg. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and Ev, if it wasn't for Evan, and we, we didn't even mention this, Ring of Honor would have had nothing to do with Mickey Rourke and the wrestler movie. Sure, yeah. He, he got us involved. So it, anyway, Matt Memories, it's on all the Apple, Spotify, blah, blah, blah. And uh, if you like wrestling history and you want to hear about the vibe, the characters, the, you know, what things were like, there were no, there was no lighting. There was ring lights. Yeah, and you know that. Yeah, and yes, there was actually there was ring light. And when those, when when the house lights went out and those white lights came down <laughs> strong, it was like yes, you know it. And yeah. This, it, you know, it wasn't like a, a Led Zeppelin concert when I'm talking about a smoke filled arena. It was a smoke filled, you know, cigarettes and cigars, and it was just you know there was no entrance music and it was magic. Magic. Yeah. So we go back 50 years. It's once a month. And hey, man, I really enjoyed talking to you. I appreciate Absolutely. It. Absolutely. Go check out Last Stop Penn Station, John DeRezzi's Matt Memories. John, another New York guy, right? Do you, uh, do you guys yes. butt heads? Because I think he's a Mets fan, right? Do you butt heads because yeah, you're a Yankee? Yeah, he's, he's a Mets fan. Out there. The Mets beat the Yankees <laughs> with a bad spell right now. Yeah, 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 but uh, yeah, they, they played two games out of shit out of City Field and lost both, but yeah, he's a good guy, he so, is. Uh, yeah, how are you? And that's yeah, not thank easy you. to say it, not easy to say in this fucking business, yeah. All right, well, Carrie, like I said, man, it's been a blast. I get, I man, I so much I can talk just on the rock and roll. I mean, I didn't even ask you about that New York rock scene, but the New York dolls kiss those guys in the 70s. God, I could talk for hours just about that stuff. Hey, I got but, to uh, go to see TVs. I saw it. Oh I yeah, CBD. I didn't. Oh man, I'm a, I'm a huge Ramones fan. I, I wasn't I didn't a even, fan. Oh. I really, you know, I fell into the Patel and Pink Floyd, and yet, yeah, but I respected. And but I was in CBGBs a couple times. One time, Skiv Baders and the Dead Boys were playing, <laughs> and, and oh. uh, yeah, talk about a shithole. Holy yeah. Christ! Yeah, oh. Murphy Rex made. The, we'll do it again. Well, it yeah. made the Murphy Rec Center look good. <laughs> I can, again, man, I can talk. I can talk for hours about wrestling with you. I can talk about hours of rock and roll. Uh, but it's it's been a blast. We'll have to do it again down the road. But in the meantime, everybody, go check out 
uh, the show Last Stop Penn Station with Ed. Ed's such a great guy, man. Such a great voice. Such a great uh, compliment to you and your storytelling. It was just, man, you guys jive so well. And uh, it was it's a very entertaining show. And again, it's, all these things that we touched on, you just, you go deep, deep in and tell so much more. Right. And you can find me on social media. You know, yeah, you're. Uh, I, 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 I'm sort of irrelevant at the moment, but. Nah, you're, but, uh, you're, you're, you're but, you uh, never know. You never know when Gary Silkin will pop up somewhere. <laughs> yeah, you know, like my favorite band says, you're never, you're never, the, the last line is, you're never too old to rock and roll if you're Absolutely. too Absolutely. There you, know? you go. <laughs> and uh, so, but yeah, so. I'm on I'm on X and Instagram R O H C A R Y and uh, Dave, it was a pleasure. Hey everybody, Gene Jackson here, inviting you to check out the Retro Wrestling Review, where each week I'm joined by some great co-hosts who help me review classic episodes of USWA Championship Wrestling. And right now we are doing week by week reviews of 1993. But we don't just do reviews. Sometimes we get a chance to interview some of the people who were there and lived it. Plus, do watch-alongs. It's a lot of fun, so check out new episodes that drop every Wednesday at WrestleCopia.com. And to find links to everything associated to the podcast, you can go to USWAPodcast.com. Welcome back to Wrestling Nostalgia. I, again, am your host, Dave Dynasty. Thank you. To Carrie Silken for coming on and doing that interview with me. What a great chat. We'll have Carrie on again in the future because, uh, like I said, man, I could talk for hours with him about so much stuff, not only just wrestling, but music, uh, so many more things. Uh, but there's so much more that we could chat, so many more stories we could tell. Uh, so I will have Carrie back on in the future uh, for a follow up. Uh, make sure you follow me on X. That's the best way to keep track of everything I'm doing. I am on there at the Dave Dynasty. And while you're out in the internet world, go check out all the WrestleCopia network of podcasts. Uh, The shows are all fun listens. They shine a light on professional wrestling history. They have great guests. Uh, Just go to WrestleCopia.com or look up the individual show titles on your favorite podcast platform. Also, be sure to check out my friends at the Ultimate Classic Wrestling Library. Go to ClassicWrestling.net or you can download their app on all of your devices. Uh, Next episode. My guest will be none other than Jumping Jim Brunzel. I'll have him on the show, and we'll talk about the High Flyers, the Killer Bees, and much, much more. Fun interview there. You don't want to miss Jim coming on the next episode. Thank you, everybody, for all of your listens, all of your supports, your follows, your interactions, everything you give to support me, to support the show. It is is just greatly, greatly appreciated. And then, so, until next episode. Wherever you go, whatever you do, be good, be safe, and always keep on growing. Fans, we brought you All-Star Championship Wrestling. This is Sam Maneker thanking you for being with us and saying until next time, so long, everyone.